early legal battles involving Indian treaty rights weren't these comprehensive cases brought by the United States, like U.S. v. Michigan. They were case-by-case -case decisions where the state would prosecute Indians for violating its fish and game laws, and Indians who were doing what they needed to do to survive and continue their culture would be defendants in state court prosecutions. And sometimes judges would be sympathetic and throw out the prosecutions, and sometimes they wouldn't. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of these cases. And some of them went up to higher courts, to state appellate courts, and some decisions were favorable and some weren't. But there was this kind of piecemeal legal confrontation going on throughout the Great Lakes region. And then, eventually, the interest in the issue rose to the federal level, and broader cases were filed in federal court. The first major one in the Great Lakes region was U.S. v. Michigan, as Bruce discussed. In the Voight litigation, the tribes themselves took the lead. And then, ultimately, when we came to the Mille Lacs case, that case was filed by the Mille Lacs Band, although, ultimately, the U.S. was also involved. We spent many years trying to get the U.S. to support us in that litigation, and it wasn't until after we had essentially settled the case with the state, only to have the settlement rejected by the Minnesota legislature after some very difficult hearings in which tribal elders were testifying in front of Minnesota legislative committees to explain the cultural and spiritual importance of these rights to them, only to be kind of harassed and berated by state congressmen and state senators, that the federal government finally decided they would come in and support the band. These larger cases raised the stakes because they would lead to a final adjudication of whether the rights existed at all, as well as to ultimately working out how they would be implemented in practice. Unlike the individual criminal prosecutions that had been going on for decades, these cases would decide once and for all whether the rights would exist. And so, on behalf of tribes, those of us who were litigating these cases, realizing the stakes that were involved, brought everything we could possibly bring to bear to explain to the court the nature and importance of the right, to allow Indian voices to be heard. And we did that both through the use of anthropologists and ethno-historians and Ojibwe linguists, but also, in addition to the fabulous experts that we had, to the testimony of Indian people. I think some of the most powerful testimony in the Mille Lacs case was to hear from Mille Lacs band members who were hunters and fishers and could talk about what those activities meant to them. One of the issues that both Bruce and Mike Lutz alluded to was once it was established that the rights existed, the question was, well, what does that mean? Who regulates the rights? How do we implement the rights? And in the kind of development of Indian treaty rights law over the past hundred and some years, the initial U.S. Supreme Court cases suggested that the states could still regulate in the interest of conservation. They couldn't regulate to extract license fees, so they couldn't require licenses from Indians. They couldn't regulate purely to keep Indians out of traditional hunting and fishing areas. But if regulations were necessary for conservation, then the states could regulate. And so through this litigation, and much of this developed both in U.S. v. Washington and in the litigation in the Great Lakes region, the tribes began to argue that, well, we can regulate. And as long as we can regulate for conservation reasons and assure the protection of the resources, then there's no room for state regulations. And the courts agreed with that. They agreed that as long as tribal self-regulation would protect the resources and protect public health and safety, there was no room for state regulation. And that's what led to the development of tribal regulatory mechanisms, the formation of intertribal organizations. And having worked with and seen a number of them, I can tell you that LIFWIC is the gold standard in this area. Today, some of the best wildlife biologists, some of the best fisheries biologists, not only in this country but in the world, work for tribes. They work either directly for tribes or through organizations such as LIFWIC. And that's led to what I think is really the kind of the frontier and the new, you know, the kind of cutting edge of Indian treaty rights, which is not only the protection of the resources but the protection of the natural ecosystems on which they depend. 
and tribes are uniquely situated to work to preserve, protect, and restore natural ecosystems because they're essential to the preservation of their treaty rights, they're essential to the pre preservation of their culture, and as I think people, many people are being beginning to realize, they're essential to everyone's survival. And so what began as an effort by Indian people to subsist in a way that they had always subsisted has become a struggle for survival on a much larger scale. It's been, it's, it's been a great privilege to be involved in this work, to represent tribes, and to be involved with an organization such as Live With. And I want to also extend my congratulations to all of you on the occasion of Blitwick's 25th anniversary.